So, hi everyone. Welcome to the next, uh, next edition of the Extremal and Probabilistic webinar. Today, our speaker is Gabor Tardos from Reni Institute and Central European University. Uh, and he will talk about pairwise crossing edges in geometric runs. And before I move the token to, to Gabor, just uh, something related to the organizational things. So Gabor really encourages you to ask the questions so he can hear them. So maybe unlike from some of the other webinars we were hosting, feel free to unmute yourself during the during Gabor's talk when you have a question and ask the question directly to Gabor. Uh, okay, so I hope I haven't forgotten anything and now I ask Gabor. Okay, the virtual stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me? Okay, great. So, yes. <laughs> uh, Thank you for this uh, platform to give this talk. And uh, uh, as you already heard, I uh, it feel free to stop me and ask questions. I try to be uh, understandable without any prior knowledge. So if you don't understand something, then just just ask. This is uh, joint work with. Uh, Janos Pach and Nathan Rubin from last year. And it's about, well, maybe against the title, it's about, uh, there's nothing to do with geometric graphs. It's about point sets in the plane. So, and now, yeah. Uh, so given endpoints in the plane in general position, so no three on a line. It's a very natural question to find some subset of the points with some kind of structure. And this particular question asks for very little structure indeed, just uh, edges determined by the segments that pairwise cross each other. So uh, you want pairs of points determining segments and these should be um, disjoint pairs so you don't want to use the same endpoint twice and you want all these um, segments to be pairwise intersecting so here is an example so you see all these uh, blue dots are points in the plane and they determine these uh, four segments that are pairwise crossing Maybe they also determine five in some other ways, but this is an example of uh, four pairwise crossing segments that they do determine. So this is uh, this can be considered as an algorithmic question. I give you the points and maximize the number of pairwise crossing segments, uh, but it can also be considered as a combinatorial problem or an extremal problem where you want to estimate how many you can always find. So what is the uh, maximal number of segments? Then no matter how I give you the endpoints in the plane in the beginning, well, they are in general position, and you can always find that many pairwise crossing segments that they determine. So let's call this f of n. And this talk is about this uh, extremal problem. So, okay, so as I said, it's a question of finding a structured subset of the points and the most structured that you can find is a subset of the points in convex position. And that question was uh, well asked and answered in some way. Uh, in 1935, so a very long time ago, by Erdős and Sekeres, who proved that uh, you will find constant times log n points in convex position out of n points in the plane. And convex position is clearly, well, way more than what you need, but it's enough. 
if you have log n points in convex position or any k number of points in convex position, then you also have k half uh, pairwise, uh, pairwise crossing segments. You just uh, connect each one with the opposite one, nine, if there are an even number of points. And this will be pairwise crossing uh, line segments. Uh, so that's one kind of an answer. It gives a lower bound. You can always find uh, log n pairwise crossing segments, but it's a very low uh, lower bound. But on the other hand, it is uh, optimal in the sense that uh, Erdős and Sekeres proved uh, actually 25 years later, they gave a construction of endpoints where the maximal size of um, a set of points in convex position is logarithmic in n. So if you want to find this much structure, then you cannot do more than log n. Uh, there was a factor of two difference between um, the Erdős Sekeres lower and upper bounds, which was recently well closed or almost closed by uh, Andrew Suk. But if you are only interested in the in the order of magnitude, then it was known that the order of magnitude is log n. So you want to go beyond that. And so the next uh, part of the history is a paper of, well, these people are Arono, Verdus, Godard, Kleitman, Klugerman, Pach, and Schulman. And that's uh, from 1994, where they actually asked this question that I'm giving the talk about. So Erdős and Sekeres didn't care about pairwise crossing segments. They cared directly about, uh, about uh, points in convex position. But uh, in this 1994 paper, uh, the authors uh, wanted to find the maximum number of pairwise crossing segments that they can find. And they prove that they can find the um, root n uh, or constant times root n pairwise crossing segments. And for this, they found something that is less of a structure than convex position, that, but still more of a structure than just pairwise crossing segments. And what they found was two sets of equal size of points that are avoiding and avoiding means that uh, they are separated by a line so there are four points on the left of this line this is the separating line four points on the right of this line in this example and the interesting property is that if you look at the, around at one point and you look at all the points on the other side then they see the points on the other side in the same order so and that's true from either side. And that's called an avoiding point set. And they found, they proved that uh, there are um, constant times root n of uh, points uh, in this avoiding configuration for in any sets of n points. And that's enough for a pairwise crossing line segments because again, there is an inherent order on both sides if you um, you can connect the opposite points, like the lowest points on the left side to the highest point on the right side, and so forth, and then you get pairwise crossing line segments. Oops. Uh, Uh, I'm not sure. Am I muted? It said the, on the uh, it said on the picture that I'm muted. No, we hear you. Okay. So sorry about that. Uh, I just tried to go back to. Uh, So, okay. 
So I was here. So this is a good lower bound, but it's still more of a structure than what we need. And indeed, um, three years later, Pavel Walter proved that uh, with this additional structure, you cannot do more. So there are endpoints in the plane that uh, if you are looking for an avoiding set, I mean, a pair of sets, uh, uh, subsets that are avoiding, then one side will have at most order of uh, square root of endpoints. So you cannot uh, improve on this uh, result by this technique, by the technique of avoiding pairs. But the conjecture is much higher. The conjecture is that uh, there are linear number of pairwise crossing segments always. So there is way to improve, but for the improvement, you need less of a structure. And a few words about the upper bound. So the trivial upper bound is that you cannot hope for better than n half because well, even the perfect matching would have n half segments. And you can go lower than n half, well, even trivially, or it's very easy to go lower than n half. It says, um, uh, if you have like four clusters of n quarter points in each in, um, in um, vertices of a concave um, uh, quadrilateral, then it's easy to prove that there is no perfect matching uh, with pairwise crossing segments. The best you can do is 3n over 8. Uh, so this is less than the trivial n half, and you can do even smaller. The best that I know of is a result of I Holzer and uh, uh, all, and that goes down to n over five, but it is still linear. So the conjecture that maybe there is, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the correction. So, so it's still linear and we don't know if linear is true. Uh, what I will speak about is a result um, with um, Janusz Bach and Nathan Rubin that uh, uh, the correct exponent is one, but it's not the, the lower bound that we prove is not exactly linear, only close to linear and to the one minus little o of one. And, uh, there are some extensions of this result. So if you have a relatively dense uh, geometric graph, so a geometric graph is a graph where vertices are points in the plane and edges are straight lines connecting the corresponding vertices. And uh, they are in general position or at least the edges don't go through vertices. Then you can find, and if you have enough edges, so quadratic number of edges would be the most that you can have. If you have almost quadratic number of edges, then you can find almost a linear number of these edges that are pairwise crossing. So this is, uh, uh, here you don't allow any pair to determine a, a, an edge. There are certain edges that are present and others are, that are not. It can be even a minority or a, 0% of the edges present, but still you can find almost a linear number of pairwise crossing edges. So that's an extension. And I want to uh, show you a extra structure that I'm not sure it's a plus, maybe it's a minus of the proof, but this is what we do. We don't just find these pairwise crossing edges, but we find some extra structure too. So the extra structure is finding uh, super edges uh, so in this picture, there are four clusters of points and two of those clusters form a super edge, the red one, and the other two form a super edge, the blue one, such that any edge from the red super edge will cross any edge of the blue super edge. So what you have is you have this cluster here and this cluster here, and any edge connecting these two is crossing any edge that would connect this cluster to this cluster. And if you have such a configuration, then you can iterate this. You can say that, okay, so now I will 
have some red edges and some blue edges in my final uh, configuration of pairwise crossing edges. But let's consider now only the red and do some recursive stuff there, find many pairwise crossing edges there and also in the blue. You can do that independently and then you have pairwise crossing edges. So that's, that's an additional structure that we find. And I have the, the uh, well, so I don't know any of this, but our proof gives something that is a little bit less than linear. So this is what it gives n over two to the order of square root of log n pairwise crossing segments. And so the rest is just speculation, but I think it's not optimal. I still think that maybe linear is uh, true, but it might be optimal for this additional structure. So if you want to find your, your uh, um, final configuration of pairwise crossing edges step by step with the super edges, then maybe this is the best you can do. So here is an example of six points that determine three pairwise crossing ed edges. Maybe you can see them, they are here. But you cannot find three with this method. So if you find uh, pairwise crossing super edges, then you can only have, uh, you can find two of those basically. There is no way to find three. So this is a restriction. This is something that is a bit more of an additional structure. Uh, and it might be true that with this additional structure or uh, bound is optimal. I, I have no proof of that. This is just speculation. So in the rest of the talk, I would like to give the, you basically, well, I guess it's more elegant to say the structure or the framework of the proof, but I will basically give the entire proof if time permits. So a, a bit more of the 1994 paper of Aronov et al. Uh, so as I said, they find avoiding sets. So their goal is that you are given these endpoints in the plane and then find a subset of those points, two subsets, two disjoint subset that are separated by a line. They are the same size, they are separated by a line and they are avoiding, meaning that the order of the points, um, if you look from one vertex on one side, I mean, look at the order of the points on the other side, it will be, will be the same. I want to rephrase this last condition. So one way to rephrase it is that if you connect two of these points on the, on the same side, then the line will not cross the convex hole of the points on the other side every point will be in the same side. And that's the same thing because um, if you look at any point on the left side of this line, they have uh, the order of these points one way and the other side, from the other side, the order of these two points will be in the other way. So if everybody is on one side, then these two points have a well-determined order if looked from the other side. In particular, this particular example that I drew is not separated because there are, uh, there are these two points and the line through them actually intersect the convex hole of the other side, meaning that from this point, the order of these uh, two points is different than from any of the other three points, if looked from the any of the other three points. So that's one way to look at avoiding. Avoiding means that if you connect two points on one side, the line will not cross the convex hole of the, the other side. And we want to relax this. So our goal is to find a relaxed version of avoiding. And this is the relaxed version. It's called epsilon avoiding. Epsilon is a small number between zero and one. And I call a configuration epsilon avoiding, it's kind of avoiding. I still have same number of uh, points on one side of a separating line than on the other side of the separating line. And then I can connect any two points on one side of the separating line 
And well, sometimes it will cross the convex hull of the other side, but maybe it doesn't happen too many times. So epsilon n squared is an upper bound. There are not more than epsilon n squared of these bad uh, pairs of points on the same side. So I guess uh, the worst kind of configuration is still uh, maybe one quarter avoiding because there are only one quarter n squared pairs of points on the same side but uh, maybe even less but if epsilon is small enough this is a meaningful notion if epsilon is absolutely zero then we are back to the avoiding concept of the aronov et al paper so this uh, particular example is 1 16th avoiding because this is the only bad part so there are n point n equals 4 on both sides and this is the only bad pair here so that's um, 1 16th times n square of the pairs are bad so here is the high level construction the initial step is we somehow find the uh, epsilon avoiding pair, just two sets of uh, points of uh, two sets of the same size, and the same size should be many. And in this uh, particular case, epsilon will be, well, around uh, two to the square root of log n, so something much less than n. Uh, much, much, uh, so 1 over epsilon is much less than n, it's much le le less than a polynomial of n and we make an epsilon avoiding pair of size that is, uh, well this, it's constant times epsilon to the 4 times n, don't worry about that exponent 4, it doesn't really matter. So this will be done uh, with the result using a result of uh, year comma two check, uh, and then comes the recursive step. So now we have an epsilon avoiding pair. So if it was zero avoiding, we would be done. We would have, uh, or uh, so if you have m points in a zero avoiding or avoiding pair, then you have m pairwise crossing segments. But uh, but that's not that's not what we have. We just have epsilon avoiding. So there will be another parameter k, and we will find basically uh, k. We will partition the these m points into m su subsets of m over k, and then these on both sides, and then we connect. Uh, one cluster on one side with one cluster on the other side, if you claim that these are pairwise crossing super edges uh, and these are still avoiding and then we can do recursion and we lose here and there. For example, if the sizes are M over K, then you have, you might have like K clusters of them, but we won't have K pairwise crossing super edges. We lose a factor of 10 here and well, these uh, pairs are avoiding, but not quite as much avoiding as they were before. So you had epsilon as the uh, constant for epsilon avoiding previously, and you lose a factor of 10 here too. So that's the recursive step. And of course, every recursion has to bottom out somewhere. So if you do this recursion, then m your number of points will decrease all the time and your epsilon will increase all the time so after a while m is too small or epsilon is too too large and then you just stop and you just pick one edge and that's the that's the bottom or, or end of the recursion there so that's the that's the structure of the proof and i think that the Recursive step is the more interesting, so I start with that. It's also the more involved. So, so what we do for uh, the recursive step is we introduce this partial order. 
So in this case, so look at the, the picture here. Uh, I want to introduce a partial order on the right hand side. This will be basically the order in which points on the left hand side see them. But of course, this is not the same order from every point on the left hand side. But if the line connecting them is disjoint from the convex hole of the left hand side, then this order is well defined and that will define the partial order. So x is less than y in this partial order if a is on the well right side of this oriented line from x to y and in this uh, well maybe less than is not uh, intuitive because in this partial particular case less than means that x is kind of higher up in this picture than y is. It's very easy to see that this is indeed a partial order. Uh, it's a partial order if the two point sets are separated by a line, if not a partial order in general. But in this case, the points on the right hand side are separated from the points on the left hand side by a line. And in this case, you have actually a partial order. Then the next thing, is, uh, okay, so this is still about the partial order. Z and T are not comparable in this partial order uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, so if you have a partial order, then there is a combinatorial observation. So we are dealing with a partial order, which is almost like a linear order. In a linear order, every pair of points is comparable and here it's not the case. It's not every pair of points that's comparable, but most of the pairs of the points are comparable except for an epsilon fraction. And if you have a partial order that is uh, like this, most pairs are comparable, then you can find a truly ordered subset. So what you have here is you take K subsets of the original partial order, these subsets will be equal size and they will be truly ordered, meaning that, so this is a subset A1, this is a subset A2, and every element of A1 is less than every element of A2, and every element is A2 is less than every element of A3. So there might be some unordered pair inside A1, also inside A2, but between them everything is fully ordered. And you can do that very efficiently, uh, depending on how small epsilon is, you can choose K to be like, maybe basically one over epsilon, and you can choose the size is basically epsilon N. So there is a factor two loss here. So you lose kind of half of the points. You only partition the set A into, so, you only partition half of the set A into this well-ordered subset. But you can always do that, and that's a very simple combinatorial lemma. If you, if you actually do that, in this case, so you have two partial orders, points on the left-hand side have a partial order, and points on the right-hand side have a partial order, then it's clear what you get. You have these clusters, and everything is well ordered between the clusters. And you have the clusters on the right hand side and it's very easy to show that if you decide to connect the lowest cluster here to the highest cluster here, so everybody is connected to the opposite cluster, then you have pairwise intersecting super edges in the sense that in this picture, if you connect any point in A1 to any point in B1, that will cross any edge that connects any point in A2 to any point in B2, and also any point from A3 to any point in B3. So, so okay, so you have these clusters, and, and then, you think that you are basically done. You have uh, all these pairwise crossing super edges. Uh, 
but not so fast because in the if you go back to what you want to do is you want to have these pairwise crossing super edges that are also somewhat avoiding so well maybe not epsilon avoiding but you need some some control over these pairs that they are still kind of avoiding and if you just uh, connect uh, the top one here to the bottom one here and so forth you have many pairwise crossing super edges but they are there are no control over how avoiding these pairs are so yeah so so that's uh, good in one way but not so good in in another way so you have to do it in a uh, bit more of a uh, bit more carefully and for more carefully the only thing you have to do is not to insist on finding an optimal matching here but just um, lose another factor of two and you say that okay half of the clusters on the left will be matched to half of the clusters on the right you do it in a monotone way so these will still be uh, pairwise crossing super edges but now you introduce a lot of randomness and you can show that if you introduce enough randomness here then these edges will be actually uh, well the expected uh, you expect them to be kind of uh, well avoiding and that's uh, that's because so so i don't give the calculation here but the idea is that if you have maybe these two points in a2 are uh, not uh, uh, compared in the partial order meaning that uh, their uh, 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 line the line through them actually crosses the right hand side okay but it's it's a geometrical observation that you can make that even if that line actually does cross the right hand side it will only cross one of the clusters in the right hand side so in the next layer it will be a good pair a pair that is comparable unless you have the bad fortune of pairing in this case oops sorry i want to still go about this so if you spare pair a2 to b3 then it will be a bad pair but if you pair a2 to b2 or b1 then there is no problem and if you have enough randomness then most of the bad pairs will go away and your um, super edges will in on average be uh, somewhat avoiding almost as good as the original set so that's the that's the main idea of the recursive step you of course you have to work out the calculation here but there is nothing tricky after after observing this and now a little bit about the initial step so so the recursive steps were uh, all losing somewhat in the size of the point sets and also losing somewhat in the uh, parameter epsilon how avoiding these sets are so in the initial set you really want to would, would like to have a lot of uh, points you want to keep a lot of points and you want to make them avoiding with a very small constant epsilon so epsilon avoiding with a small constant epsilon and for this we use a result of uh, here Kamatushek that given endpoints in the plane again in general position there are well there is another parameter r then there will be constant times r squared lines such that the zone of an arbitrary line contains not too many of your original points at most n over r so let me uh, sorry about that no update okay so 
so this is, uh, so I, I will just uh, now show this statement in action. This is your point set, this is your endpoint. And then uh, the CRM of Matushek claims that, uh, so maybe your R is like two and you want to an arrangement where uh, every zone contains at most half of the points. So I will tell you what the zone is in a second, but first, so the Matushek claims that you can have a few lines like these blue lines that separate the points into all these uh, small cells. And what you want is not that each of the cells contains not too many of the points, that would be easy, but you want that the, the zones don't contain. So what is a zone? For a zone, you can take an arbitrary line. So not just uh, one of these blue lines, but you just can have an arbitrary line. I just added a red line here. This is a red line. And the zone of the red line is every point that is not separated from the red line by blue lines. So if you look at uh, this point here, it's separated from the red line because it's in a cell of the blue arrangement that is totally disjoint from the red line. But this point or this point is in the zone of the red line because you can connect it to the red line without crossing any blue lines. So all these points that now turned red are in the zone of the red line. And hopefully this is uh, less than half of the points that, to, that we started with. And the uh, result of Matushek says that you can only do that and you don't need too many lines. In particular, uh, you don't need more than quadratic number of lines and we don't know if that's optimal at all. Uh, something much closer to linear is uh, maybe possible or not, I don't know. But uh, this, uh, this is not uh, a bottleneck of our proof. So we don't care about these exponents here that much. Okay, so what we do here is we apply this result and the way we apply it is, uh, well, you have endpoints in the plane we choose R uh, basically to the epsilon that we want to achieve. Then we have uh, this arrangement of the blue lines that is uh, given by uh, the uh, result of Matushek. And well, there are maybe epsilon to the minus four cells in the arrangement and possible that each of those cells contain the same number of points. That's the simplest case. Then you just take two random cells and uh, that will be the, so maybe this one and this one. And that will be the, the, two sets of the same size that are epsilon avoiding. Uh, if um, the point sets are not roughly equal size in the cells, then the large one you partition into smaller sets so that they end up being roughly equal and then you do the same thing. That's just the technicality here. Uh, and the main thing is that whatever you end up with, that will be two cells. Well, they are not necessarily epsilon avoiding, but they are separated by a line for sure because they are different cells in this line arrangement. So one of these lines will actually separate them. So that's a good start. The only thing is that how many of the pairs, so for example, this might be not an epsilon separating pair because these two, uh, uh, points determine a line that will cross the convex hole of the other side. So this is not a totally separated uh, point, a pair of point sets. But the observation is that typically it will be epsilon separated with a good epsilon because 
every line here that is determined by two points in the same cell will not cross too many other cells because the zone will not have too many points. So if you pick a random other cell, random other set of uh, not too many points, then the convex hull of that will not be crossed uh, in general. Uh, so the expected number of, uh, so it will be epsilon avoiding where the expected value of epsilon is what, you, what it should be. So that's the, that's the initial step of the, uh, so I didn't give you all the details about the initial step or the recursive step, but I basically give you enough uh, for the entire proof. There is uh, not much mystery left in the proof after this. Uh, it's a very simple recursive argument. And the, the handicap is that maybe because of this recursive structure, it doesn't give you a linear bound. It just gives you a close to linear bound. So, yeah. So, yeah, so this is the same thing in writing. And so let's, uh, let's look at uh, the directions of possible extensions of this result. Um, Uh, so this uh, first extension that I, I wrote here is uh, about the opposite problem. So in all this talk, we were looking for uh, edges determined by the endpoints such that these are pairwise intersecting and the opposite of intersecting is, uh, well, it is sometimes called avoiding segments or um, skew segments or whatever, but all these words are uh, kind of uh, misleading. What we mean is that the line of one of these segments does not cross the other segment. So crossing means that the line of both segments cross the other segment. And the opposite of that is that la the line of neither of the two segments crosses the other segment. And uh, these two things, crossing and avoiding, is uh, kind of dual. And most of the uh, problems, they behave similarly. And this is one of those examples. These two behave similarly. The same proof technique uh, gives um, the same bound for uh, pairwise avoiding uh, segments and also there is a direct connection between them, even a black box connection. If you have any bound for the pairwise crossing um, case, then a similar bound applies for the pairwise avoiding case too. Uh, this one I already mentioned in the uh, introductive introduction part of the talk that. Uh, uh, the geometric graph case is that you are not only given endpoints, but you are given endpoints and uh, some pairs of uh, vertices determine edges where other pairs of vertices don't determine edges and you want to find pairwise crossing edges. So that's an added restriction. You cannot pick any two points. You have to pick two points that uh, actually determine, edge, determine an edge in the geometric graph. And this whole technique works um, the same way if, um, if your graph is uh, very dense, meaning, uh, well, it doesn't have to be linearly dense. There doesn't have to be a quadratic number of edges, but n to the two minus little o of one edges is enough. Then you find n to the one minus little o of one pairwise crossing edges in the graph. The complication that comes with this is that uh, in the recursive step, you don't have to, so what we had to worry about in the recursive step is finding epsilon avoiding pairs of sets that have two good parameters. First, they had to have uh, enough number of points in them. 
And second, they had to have uh, good avoiding properties, so this epsilon avoidance. And uh, for this, you have to worry about the third uh, property that, well, the geometric bipartite graph that they determine has enough edges. So just having enough points is not necessarily enough because maybe there is no edge of the geometric graph connecting them. But, uh, but it kind of works uh, if the graph is dense enough. And now comes the things that I don't know the answer for. The first is the, that I started with. The conjecture was a linear number of pairwise crossing segments. Is this true? Is this not true? Even if it's not true, I don't think that this um, n over two to the square root of log is the optimal bound. I think that you can do better than that. Uh, maybe linear, maybe n over log n or something like that, uh, but that's open. And the other open question is what if your geometric graph is not so dense? So, or proof um, breaks down as soon as you have like n over um, three half edges. So more clearly, if you have a geometric graph, you have just n edges, then they can form a perfect matching or something and nothing is true. But, but if you have n to the three half edges in an n vertex geometry graphs, one would assume or one would guess that uh, you will find close to square root n, close to the average degree number of pairwise crossing edges. Uh, but we are not able to prove that. And the, the open problem that is uh, maybe the farthest away from um, so the next one is, uh, I think it's a very interesting open problem, but these particular techniques don't seem to be well suited to handle it. It's what about topological graph? So topological graph is a graph where uh, the edges are not straight line, but curves. And uh, you can, even for a complete topological graph, you can ask for many pairwise crossing edges. And this uh, partial order technique that we used were very closely re related to, I mean, really dealing with uh, fixed geometric arrangement and uh, uh, with these topological graphs, um, the curves can go any odd way and it's very hard to apply this uh, this technique there. So this is uh, the one that I, uh, I mean, this really needs, it's, I think it's the most important of these three open problems, but it needs the something, uh, uh, really a new idea here. Um, so thank you very much. This, this is the talk that I preferred and against my encouragement, Nobody really stopped me. So if you have any questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Gabor, for a really nice and, and clear talk. So maybe that's why there were not that many questions mm -hmm. during the talk. Anyways, uh, if anybody has a question, I believe one should be allow one should be able to just unmute themselves and ask the question. But if not, uh, raise your hand and I or Honza, the other Honza will unmute you. So anyways, are there any questions? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hear yeah. So about these topological graphs, you don't know anything, you don't have any, any bound? I don't want to say Take the complete so at, at complete topological graph. Complete topological graph. Um, uh, Janus, Janus Bach will know this if he's here. <laughs> I don't know what's the best that is known. Uh, we wanted to prove something that is close to the average degree. So in this case, close to linear and uh, nothing remotely close to that uh, is known. Thanks.
so well if there are no more questions let me check the chat in case uh so i'm planning to unmute everyone so that we can give a round of applause to gabor so uh if you don't like to be recorded when clapping then <laughs> disconnect please <laughs> uh so yeah i'm unmuting all in five four three two one okay thank you thank you gabor